There is something special about creating music with Vocaloid. The challenges of creating imagery or immersion being limited to just lyrics or music in most scenes is gone due to the well-accepted use of animation pictures or video. Some may reject it as nothing more than eye candy distracting from what's important, but for someone like Nabuna, he viewed it as a new form of music, and in his eyes they served as powerful tools to immerse us in the worlds that he created. In every song that he posted in Nico Nico, we retreated to these warm worlds of summer nostalgia with just a pinch of melancholy mixed in there. He stated in an interview back in 2015 that for him, scenery is the first thing that always comes to mind when writing a song. And that sort of dedication to accurately displaying a mental image to your audience is no easy feat. To pull your audience into an experience, every detail has to have some sort of impact, and you can see it in everything that he does. From the bright warm colors he asks his artists to use in his music videos, to the vivid details he provides to his audience and his lyrics. For me personally, my favorite music videos by him were the ones made by Awashima. When I was making this video, I started to realize I wanted to re-watch these not simply to listen to the songs, but to look at the art again because they were that beautiful. Awashima's art had this amateur hand-drawn nature to them, but a closer look at the work clearly paints a different picture. I would say we already naturally associate colored pencils with children's art supplies, am I right? But the thing is, Awashima had a tendency to go above the call of duty. The way the backgrounds in Sea Lily are made to look like they're hastily filled in with a colored pencil, or the way you can see the line breaks in the protagonist of Melu, helps cement this feeling that the work was made by a child, which in turn helps cement that feeling of nostalgia these music videos always seem to evoke. It's clear to see that Nabuna was very fortunate to have the ability to work with so many talented artists over the course of his career, to create these incredible works of art. But there was always something that bothered me about them, something that just didn't seem right. Most of his songs are dark and somber in terms of tone, focusing on themes of unrequited love, regret, or loss, and they very rarely end on a happy note. You would think writing something like that, you would want something darker or more somber to match it like Mari 2 does. But instead, these characters are trapped in these surreal, beautiful worlds that they can never really find any pleasure in. Have you ever noticed how it looks like they have no interest in anything around them? It's almost like a jail cell actively mocking them. The contrast kind of reminds me of Utata P's Happiness series, but frankly, in my opinion, this is far more disturbing, just by how casually the listener can ignore the messages of these songs if they wanted to. Let's take First Train and Kafka as an example. If you look at this song at a glance, it's gorgeous, even uplifting if I dare say. The bright colors, the lonesome train, the sundress, the music is upbeat and you even have this super cute hook during the chorus. But don't be fooled, there's a reason why the word Kafka is in the title of this song. The song is loosely based on Franz Kafka's 1950 novel, The Metamorphosis. The plot focuses on a salesman named Gregor Samsa, as he slowly finds himself turning into this monstrous vermin. I'm not going to say bug here since it's never specifically stated in the book, but the song in the same sense is about a girl finding herself turning into a giant, poisonous bug, who's isolated herself from the people she loves and kills time alone by admiring sunflowers. Trying to find the right words to convey to someone she loves on paper during her final hours, but unfortunately nothing comes out. And yet nothing about this song would tell you this. Not the video, not even the music. In fact, I made one of my friends from college watch this without any context, and to tell me what he thought it was about. And his reaction is about what you expect. And the weird part is, Nabuna seems to have a clear stance against not telling us why he does this. Instead, focusing on the fact that he's simply a dark person and can't write a straightforward love song. To me, it almost seems like Nabuna is, well, mocking people who only look at music on a surface level, and don't pay attention to what's actually being said, like Andre 3000 did on Hey Yeah. And I think that undaunting curse to push boundaries and not necessarily make the art that matches the audience's expectations is the key to his success over the years. So I briefly talked about in my Deco video that Nedu said there was only one song that hit 1 million views in 2015, and I said it was probably Melu. And my reason for that is that the song has quadrupled the number of views of any song that came out that year. But one question that wasn't answered for me was, why? I know 2015 wasn't a super great year for Vocaloid, but there were some great songs that came out that year. So what about Nabuna made them stand out so much? Well, my first assumption was that Melu had simply been that popular because of Nabuna's reputation. I mean, you go all the way back to the Tale of the Deep Sea Lily at the beginning of 2014, and you see his tracks were toppling everyone else's at that time. But that didn't feel right. I mean, if people were just listening to his music because his name was attached to it, then why did he drop in popularity after Transparent Allergy? Why suddenly spike at such a random time? 
And then I realized Rocket changed drastically since 2009. Rock had been a dominating genre in Vocaloid during the late 2000s and early 2010s. Of course, nothing was ever going to overthrow pop, but artists like Deiko Nina, Will Waka, and Nedu showed that they were artists not to be underestimated. And what was so distinct about vocal rock was that it was a field dominated by bold guitar melodies or bass lines, with plenty of reverb or distortion. If you don't get what I really mean, think of a punk or grunge type sound like Nirvana, then a pop rock like The Beatles. But I think for a lot of people by 2012, they were getting bored of listening to that garage band sound that was so popular at that time. And as the scene continued to evolve, so did the sound of the music the producers were putting out. There seemed like there was a push to make more polished and cleaner sounding produced music even in the pop scene. And what I found interesting is that vocal rock seemed to be taking influences from its pop counterpart. Before there always seemed to be a clear dividing line between the sound of both. Of course with a few exceptions, but it seemed like the line was getting harder and harder to split. I mean, just look at a song like Setsuna Trip. In terms of sound, this song couldn't be any farther from a song like Rolling Girl, that was only popular a few years prior. And so you gradually saw this push away from the rock that we knew and towards pop rock. But the issue was, as more time passed, there seemed to be less of those straightforward rock songs. Even people like Gene and Nettu quickly realized that they wanted to continue to stay relevant, they would have to keep evolving to keep up with artists like Kemu or Last Note. Compare something like Kagero Days in terms of sound to something like Hizadaki Attention. Compare something like Abstract Nonsense to Terror. But Nabuna was special in a sense that he never changed what he wanted to make. I mean, if you look constantly throughout his discography, he made stripped back rock songs. Songs not focused necessarily on creating a polished sound. He was in a true sense, a successor to the music that was so popular during the last generation of Vocaloid. But the key difference here is that he wasn't necessarily making that same kind of music. At least not to a T. Nabuna was always exposed to music from a young age. His sister could play the drums, his other sister could play the piano. His mother could play the flute, his grandfather could play the acoustic guitar. He recalls memories of trying to play the piano for his sister, and at the same time you could hear his mom playing the flute in the other room, and then his sister playing the harp on the other floor. It was for sure a crazy household to grow up in. But it would be that same household that would influence him to pick up music, when his brother inspired him to pick up the guitar during his second year of middle school. It was during this time he started to expand his knowledge not only on rock, but on multiple different genres. He started listening to rock first, of course. But he found a love for blues through artists like Larry Carlton and Johnny Winter, and then that eventually went to post-rock and shoegaze, saying one time he was a large fan of the group My Bloody Valentine. This also led to an interest in EDM. He has a love for experimental Icelandic pop group Mum, a band known for their use of electronic glitch beats and soft vocals. And if you listen to these groups, you start to get a general idea of how they influenced Nabuna's sound and his direction as an artist, particularly the use of soft vocals in electronics and rock. There really isn't any special story for how Nabuna got into Vocaloid. He was simply just looking around the internet and he was shot by the mix of music from so many different genres, and simply just started to listen to more and more of it. He'd been satisfied with just making and finishing songs on his own time, but when he found Vocaloid he viewed it as a chance to share his music with others. And if you look through Nabuna's discography on Nico Nico, you can see that he was very passionate and consistent about posting music on the site when he first started. Now don't hate me when I say this, but I honestly don't find much of his early work to be that good. The sense on songs like Bokura Kokai Photographa or Yukure Kokai Kimito Boku are very sloppy and the mixing on some of the tracks too is very rough. It made the tracks lose some of the weight that I think they need. But Nabuna was obviously a beginner and the fact that he had an audience is proof that he had talent or was doing something special. And to me what I thought was special about Nabuna was not the rock portion of his music per se, but the electronics that he incorporated. I really don't think it's a coincidence that his first breakout hit happened to be Transparent Elegy, a song that heavily uses synths that, well, remind me a lot of the shoegaze and EDM he grew up on. And I think it serves as a gateway for people into his music because it wasn't necessarily just straight rock. It was an incorporation of a lot of different influences, and it serves as a turning point for his career, because his mindset at this point became serious. He talked about later how he couldn't afford to make something bad after this, so he started listening to other artists to study composition, arrangement, and mixing. But thankfully, he was about to get a lucky break. 
Around the same time that Nabun was starting, Kenji Yonisu, better known as Hachi in the Vocaloid community, had been pursuing work on his first album under a major label. This album would later be called Yinki, and it would be heavily influenced by the Japanese rock that Yonisu grew up on. There was one track on the album though that was tearing at him. He felt like it fit the album, but at the same time it felt like a track he would make in his Vocaloid days. So he decided to put it on the album, but he also made a Vocaloid version too. And on October the 28th, 2013, Hachi would drop a bombshell on the scene. Out of nowhere he would drop Donut Hole, his first song in over two years. The song was a massive success and sent shockwaves throughout the scene. It was the second time Hachi had ever used a live band to record his songs, and it was rooted in that rough garage band sound that was so popular during his time. And it gave the scene a taste of that sound that they loved so much. Adding in the success of smaller tracks like About Me by Cho Cho P, and you had the elements leading to a perfect storm. The Tale of the Deep Sea Lily still stands as Nabuna's most popular track on Nico Nico, with over 6 million views. It's a song that rightfully deserves all the praise and recognition it received, too. For one, I think Nabuna's hard work in learning how to mix and arrange finally paid off. The Tale of the Deep Sea Lily is one of those songs that could take so many different intricate parts and somehow make them fit so perfectly together. From the synths to the bass to even multiple different guitar parts, there's so much that can't be soaked in with just one listen. For the observant listener, even the quiet sections during the verses has something to offer. But even before Nabuna, no one before him had managed to take such a raw and rough approach when it came to using both electronic music and rock in the scene. It resembled the work that Kenmu had been making, except more focused on striking a balance between rock and EDM. The production as well had a more sluggy and distorted sound. Some people might find the production and tuning of his tracks hard on the ears, or even messy compared to someone like Mitchy M, but to me that was largely the appeal of his music. As crazy as it sounds, when you listen to so much polished and cleanly produced music, it almost becomes a saving grace to have someone come in and pull out something so much more grating. There's something so gratifying about how heavy the strings feel in songs like Dawn and Firefly. The way the strings seem to stick to his pick as he plays. If you watched my Deco video, you know that I think an artist that isn't willing to adapt or change when things become stale is well doomed to be forgotten. But the funny part is that's what I find so admirable about Nabuna. Because instead of abandoning the sound he was carefully crafting over each song, he instead doubled down on it, and he did it in a time where he honestly should have failed. To put it in perspective, Nabuna started his career during the peak of both Gene and Nedu's careers. And to be honest, at the time, I don't think any of his songs besides Transparent Allergy were unique or generally good enough to compete against songs like The Lost Ones Weeping or Lost Time Memory. But he was determined to keep approving instead of trying to meet other people's expectations. He simply just made what he wanted, and Nabun was so good at conveying emotion through vocaloids. You only need to listen to the bridge of First Train and Kafka to understand why he became so famous for these shaky, unstable vocals he gave his songs. There's a certain way to convey, it's almost like a singer on the verge of an emotional breakdown. So let's go back to 2015. Why was Melly the only song to hit a million views that year? It was because one boy, no matter how much the science told him to change, to give up, that he was doomed to be a one-hit wonder, doubled down on what he loved and dedicated his time to approving. Until the tables turned and he realized he was the only one left that had evolved as an artist. Nabuna was kind of like a blooming flower in the middle of a drought. When everyone had packed up and left, him and Arnstar kept pushing forward by reaching the pinnacles of their careers on the scene, making these beautiful rock songs that gave off this peaceful, almost melancholic sunset atmosphere. It was like instead of letting the scene go out with a crash, they were slowly nursing it and putting it back to sleep, saying this isn't the end, it's just a long needed rest. Thanks for watching.